and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Please remember to visit the website podcastufo.com for past episodes, blogs, and forums. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and we have a great show for you this evening. We have Erica Lukes coming up. She's going to talk about if there's anything new or uh, maybe just what happened at the Skinwalker Ranch. We're going to be talking about that in her home state. And uh, we have Alejandro Rojas coming up with the news in just a minute. I did want to tell the uh, listeners out there that we do have a, a new blog writer. His name, now I'm probably going to not do a good job with this, is Guridat Shanoi. He's from India, wrote a great blog, and um, is all excited to write several more. Uh, this one uh, that he wrote is just posted, and it's uh, the, the uh, Kelly Hopkinsville Encounter of the Goblin Kind. That's how he uh, added the title to that. So uh, a great, a uh, lot of good feedback on that. So I hope you check it out. Um, thanks so much for supporting the show if you are, and if you're not, you can for only $2 or more a month. All that information is on our website, podcastufo.com. We are running on YouTube live streaming, if you care to watch that, every Wednesday evening at 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our full show is free always on the Dark Matter Digital Network, and that's on Thursdays at 10 to midnight, again, Eastern Standard Time. And the Everything Else show, um, we did a great one last week that will be posted soon with a uh, sole survivor and a life raft, Stephen Callahan, very nice. Next Monday, we have Michael uh, Griesbach. Uh, he's a, he was a prosecutor for the Stephen Avery case. If anyone watched Making a Murderer, that's going to be pretty interesting next uh, week. So that's it for me, Alejandro. What's going on? How are you? I am doing all right. I still surprisingly have not recovered from my illness. Um, so I still got to cough. I'll try not to cough on air for you and some sniffles. Oh, man. So I'll try not to make any disgusting, uh, you know, sick like noises. OK, well, good to have you back. You were missed last week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, Jordan uh, Bonaparte filled in for the news, but there were still some sniffles. There were people oh, cool. out there that missed you. So oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, people. I'm back. I'm back, peep. So, you know, buck up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I hope you feel better. We'll give each other some virtual hugs. Let's do a little virtual hug here. There wow. you go. There you go. I'm patting your I back. I get in on that one. As yeah. we virtually hug. Yeah. Okay, yep, you're in here too. Oh, yep, you're uh, careful with the hands there. <laughs> uh, okay, so hopefully that makes everybody feel better. But, uh, yeah. So what's... So I am yeah. back. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know you're, you're a busy guy today. Is there anything exciting happening? There are some exciting things. So just a couple of things I'll touch on are, that are in the headlines. And I think, you know, because uh, there are often things in the headlines that I either don't get around to writing about these days or because um, uh, I'm getting spread a little thin. Or maybe they're just they're interesting, but not to the level of, of g- getting their own story on our mm. site. So. I'll talk a couple about those things. And then uh, we do have some interesting reports from Roger Marsh again from MUFON. So um, the couple of tidbits out there. Now, NASA is going to reveal something about oceans, um, extraterrestrial oceans, essentially. There's a couple uh, moons out there in particular that have oceans. Nobody's quite sure exactly, I guess, what they're going to be talking about. Probably uh, about Saturn's moons or something like that. But I will warn you, it's going to be at 2 p.m., 11 a.m. Pacific time, which is where I am, uh, on Thursday, April 13th. Um, I'll warn you that a lot of the stories that you're reading out there about this come from the U.K. tabloids. Mm. 
I did see that. They're bad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so of course they're blowing it up out of proportion, and they they just overly sensationalize everything, and it's it's very unfortunate. Uh, so be careful what you read out there. You know the link I have is to TechCrunch, and they say it's probably not going to be anything related to extraterrestrials, but it ought to be interesting. And of course the the sun and and these places are trying to make it out to be like you know aliens are going to attack us from the oceans of the moons of saturn or something but didn't uh, that happen last about last uh, about a year ago when they were ready to make an announcement that there was all this uh hubbub and ended up being you know just a minor announcement after all it's been happening over the last several (laughs) years especially the last two or three years and it's mostly because now, really, a, a lot of their announcements are astrobiological in nature. So they're in regards to extraterrestrial life, which is exciting. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, the media, especially some of these, these you know, poor tabloids that over-sensationalize everything. And, you know, and NASA, I'm sure their scientists are really excited and they sit down and they're like, we found a microbe in one case. And one of the first times this happened, we found a microbe in in California uh, that is in a a, uh, like this lake and it it lived exists like no, you know, microbe can. So uh, that means, you know, maybe there's there's even more life out there, more possibilities for life than we had previously thought. That's probably exciting to them, but, you know, compared to what it was made out to be, that, that's really boring and lame. <laughs> and so people who were disappointed. Um, so, yeah, so you have to take what these, these uh, sensationalistic sites say with a grain of salt. So we'll see what it is. I'm sure I'm going to be excited about it either way. I was excited about the California thing that everybody got disappointed about and, and all of them thus far because they are interesting things. And certainly, you know, these moons in um, Saturn, like, but are Enceladus and um, uh, is one of them. I, I, they've got all these weird names, but uh, that could possibly have life uh, in these vast oceans. I mean, that's, that's so extremely exciting. It is. Uh, that would be. So that's, that's, mm-hmm. that you said is, uh, so there's that 11 story. o'clock yeah. and, uh, that's Pacific time. It's going to be on, right? Is that what you said? Uh, huh. right. 11 o'clock Pacific, uh, Thursday. Uh, what is today? Today's the 12th. Today must be Wednesday, yes, right? That's right. Holy moly. Days keep flying by. I'm so mixed up. So that's tomorrow. That's right. For some reason, I was thinking today was Tuesday, but I didn't think it was weird that we were doing this interview on Tuesday, and I don't know what's going on with my oh. brain. But anyway, here's another exciting one. An audiobook, an X-Files audiobook that is going to be read by David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson, um, who, of course, played the characters Fox Mulder mm-hmm. and Agent Scully. So that's kind of exciting. That was a story on Nerdist. You can read more about all of these stories if you go to our daily UFO headlines, uh, which we post every day. If they're not in today's headlines, it's always good to catch up. You can go to our articles and then go to daily UFO headlines, and you can just see a long, long list. It's great for research because you get a bunch of stuff about you know mainstream news, uh, information about UFOs and stuff. So you can go there for that. So that's that. Um, otherwise... Triangles. You know, Roger Marsh posts stories for, for from MUFON for us on our website, and he does try to look for stuff that's visually has some sort of visual component, such as a uh, artist rendering from the uh, witnesses. So we did post a couple of those this week. In particular, today is a sighting from Wednesday, February twenty second. It was seen at eight thirty p.m. These people were at a stoplight when something caught their eyes. They glanced and they noticed a line of bright lights. Um, They kept watching it, and uh, they said these lights were in a triangular formation. They weren't blinking or anything. And uh, the the object, they said, moved um, a couple times, and uh, then it was gone. So this person was trying to drive it and look at it at the same time. This is still under investigation. Of course, it could be Chinese lanterns, but um, uh, the witness did draw what he saw, and so he has a, a drawing of, of seven lights, um, one in the center, and then you know 
two kind of arms coming out of three lights each. So very, very symmetrical mm-hmm. um, in nature. So another possible triangle? I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? We are- and this one was in uh, one Pennsylvania, more. right? Pennsylvania. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other one, which is really cool, is from November 2015. Uh, this one's just exciting because of the drawings. This person uh, drew a bunch of stuff. Now, this was more diamond-shaped, um, but this, said, this person said it was floating 200 feet above them, and they drew kind of themselves stopped and walking out in the road to look at this thing. Uh, above them, and and they did some really neat drawings to show just this oddly shaped object that this person had seen. Now, this uh, drawing looks like one of the drawings I remember in the uh, the flap um, uh, back in nineteen eighty nine, uh, the Belgium flap. Mm-hmm. It looks a little bit like it. Mm-hmm. One of the drawings from over there does yeah you know um a lot of times in these triangular ufo flaps or or when there's more they're they're not always completely triangular mm. uh even when it comes to the phoenix lights this week and next week i'm doing all these interviews about the phoenix lights because there's a new movie coming out phoenix oh, yes. forgotten yeah and yeah so and they've asked me to go uh talk to some of our local media about the phoenix lights to get them excited for the movie so i said sure you know help me uh uh, um, promote what we do. And, and it's such an incredible sighting. But in that sighting, you know, there were a lot of different shapes that were reported, That's actually. Right. Yes. So um, some of them are very oddly shaped. Some of them are boxes. Some of them just aren't quite triangular, um, even though we're most familiar with the idea of um, the uh, more larger triangle kind of chevron shape. Uh, so, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh- so very odd, and I think that gives credibility when the shape is kind of weird, you know. Um, I do too. This is probably a good time to announce this is next week. Um, we do have the director on the show from the Phoenix Forgotten movie, uh, Justin. Oh, yeah, Justin do. Barber is going to be on the show. All right, well, Alejandro, is that it for this evening? That is it for this evening. Thank you so much, sir, and we will be talking to you next week. My pleasure. Talk to you soon. Have a great show. All right. Show. Hang in, everyone. We'll be right back after this quick music break with Erica Lukes. Hello there, Erica. How are you? I am just happy to be here. How are you? Great. Always good to have you on. I think it was, uh, I was in Russia last time you were on, so it was uh, about a, almost a year ago now. I know. It, time flies when you're having uh, fun in the UFO that's world. Right. <laughs> uh, no pun intended. It's flying. Yes. Um, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, I'm so sorry I missed you and everybody else out there in Phoenix, uh, uh, this February, and um, so I'm sure you had a great time out there without me, and yes. Of course. You know, we did, even though we were very <laughs> heartbroken. <laughs> Sobbing. We were sad. Well, I was very sad I couldn't hang out with you. We had a great time, yeah. and they always do such an amazing job at UFO yes, Congress. Yes, always. Uh, I love going. I'm, You know, I'm going to drive out next year, so I'm going to take some extra time off and just see the whole Southwest, which I, 
you know, like to do. So that'll be next year. So for the person who um, has not listened to you before when you were on my show, can you tell them your basically your background and, and what got you interested in UFOs? And then later on, we'll talk. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Skinwalker Ranch. It's a fascinating uh, topic to speak about right in your home state there. It is. I'm so lucky. Utah is the most amazing place. And so I've just, I've got lots to talk about with regard to Utah, but I have always been interested in, you know, the paranormal and in, in UFOs. I've just, since I was a little child, it was something that intrigued me. And in my early to late teens and, and 20s, I had some interesting paranormal experiences that were witnessed by everybody around me. And that was interesting. That kind of sp- you know, just got me going um, and wanting to learn more about that field. And then in 2013, I had some some sightings of the amber orbs over the Salt Lake Valley. And to me, it was so incredible. And I wasn't the only one seeing them, but I wanted to to know what they were because they were in the flight corridor for the Salt Lake International Airport. They were over den- a densely populated, you know, the most populated city in Utah. And they were 80 miles away from one of the most frightening places on earth, which is Dugway Proving Ground. So I got, you know, I just, I decided I was going to investigate on my own and I called Hiller Force Base. You know, of course, they were so helpful. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I called Doug Ray Proving Ground, you know, the FAA, but I was making the rounds and I guess I put myself on the map back then, but I really wanted to to learn about it. And I called New Fork and Peter Davenport was great. And it told me about the orange amber orbs. And he'd been having a lot of different sightings all over the country with regards to those and I wanted to to get into a, a group where we could talk about it and research it, and I found MUFON. That was, at the, that point in time, was a defunct chapter because Elaine Douglas had been the state director, and she had passed away after a, a pretty gnarly falling out with MUFON. So I became a field investigator and then state director, and... It was a it was a great time. It was fun to learn, and I I am still doing that and researching. But it's just I've gone a little bit more underground, and I found some very incredible people that don't like to be out in the the public eye. That they're helping me behind the scenes. Wow! And so that was a that was an interesting run because you also got involved in the orange orbs part of it as well. You know, I did, and that. That was something to me as as state director, I could look at not only the sightings that were coming into Utah, but, you know, I was going through the MUFON database and seeing that a majority of the sightings coming in were these, you know, lights in the sky cases. And a lot of state directors and field investigators were dismissing them. And, okay, great. So a lot of times people mistake things. But, you know, to me, when you've got things that are behaving in specific ways, like moving against the wind, we know they're not Chinese lanterns, when they're hovering for upwards of an hour and they're in restricted airspace or, you know, so on and so on, then you know that this isn't something that is mundane. This is anomalous and it deserves to be looked at. But it was shocking to me how many people just kind of brush those cases aside. I found out about Heshtalen in Norway. They've done 30 years of extensive research. I think the best research in the world. And I reached out to Erling Strand, who is the lead of, of Heshtalen, and he has given me great advice. I really admire him. And I think that you know, I found people like Dr. Massimo Teodorani, who has researched different hotspots in the world, like a site in Arizona, like Heshtalen, a site in Italy, and has produced really, really good scientific research. And that's, to me, that was my goal to try to open people's eyes to get field investigators and the state directors to look at the fact that this is 
very anomalous and we need to stop dismissing them thinking that we're going to get some sort of you know, golden nugget or the one nuts and bolts case. That's not what we're dealing with. That's not what we're looking at. We're looking at repeated patterns and we're looking, we need to analyze the data. Now, when you started getting interested in this topic and you started getting involved and um, sort of uh, reinvigorated MUFON in your state and stuff like that, did you also catch any flack about that as well from friends or anything like that? Was this was there our family? Was there any difficulties as far as any of that goes? You know, I mean, I am a business owner, and I've been I've lived in Utah my whole life. And when I first started seeing these objects, you know, I was I was videotaping them, I was photographing them, and so I posted a couple of things on Facebook just to test the waters, and you know, got some mixed reactions, and I kind of pulled back a little bit, but. As I learned more, I learned how to approach people with it, and I learned how to kind of intuitively sense when their eyes were glazing over and I should just be quiet. But I think if you present yourself in a a, a logical, intelligent way, you can open people's eyes, you know, it's... So it, it, that's been a fun learning process, too, just to try to figure out how to relay the information to people and make it palatable. Yes, yes. Uh, it's funny. I had a um, – I do another show. I did one um, with Steve Callahan. He was out on a raft for um, 76 days, a lone survivor, and all these different things to survive. So that was a, a great – I was doing the show actually at his house last Sunday. Uh, we got all done, and he said to me, well, how did you get into – you know, doing this type of thing. And I said, well, I do a show, a real, you know, popular show on UFOs. And he goes, oh, really? So he started telling me about his amazing sighting <laughs> that I wish I caught on the show. It was uh, glowing. He was in, I think it was Hong Kong and in and, and a boat. And all these people saw it and these three glowing discs went right over them and in formation. And, uh, but he was saying, you know, I'm not going to say they're alien. I just, you know, it was a pretty good, healthy, skeptic way to say it. He said, I just don't know what they were, he said, or if they could be explained in any type of way. So, Well, and I think that's, that's a great point. I think that sometimes we take that leap, identifying them as extraterrestrial, when in reality, none of us truly know. And so perhaps we had to kind of tone that down a little bit and just say we have something anomalous and let's get out in the field and, and research that. And maybe that would make it, you know, again, more palatable for people. Yes, yes. All right. I want to talk. Um, we have plenty of time here, of course, but I do want to talk about the Skinwalker Ranch because um, yeah, I know you've been there. Um, and uh, I did. I've been reaching out to George Knapp ever since I read his book um, that he co-authored. And um, he is such a busy guy. Now, I know you were on Coast to Coast with him a while back. Um, and so... Yes. He said something to me, you know, at least he does communicate with me anyway, he was as busy as he is. But he says he's just, um, there's really nothing that he is able to announce now. Uh, that's how we put it. And But I know there's new buyers, but, um, and I don't know what you know about that or not. But for the person who is not familiar <laughs> with uh, Skinwalker Ranch, let's talk about what an odd and unusual place that is. And how far is that from you about? You know, this, it's about 200 plus miles, and it's in the Uinta Basin, which is a beautiful place um, in Utah, and it is very rural. You have a lot of cattle ranchers, you have a lot of um, oil fields, and it is, you know, it's, it's just a just got good, solid people that live there, and it. It is one of I to me. The more I learn about different places in the world, the more, more I absolutely know that there is something in this place that is is similar to other places in the world, but it seems to be more prevalent. I mean, you have a you have a place not only at the Sherman Ranch or now at Mantium Ranch because those are that is the new mystery oh. owner, but you've got the whole periphery of that area where there have been repeated sightings decade after decade that have been documented by Junior Hicks, who is now 
90 years old. He has been absolutely relentless in doing this, and he's been a great source of strength to the community. Um, and so do you know if, um, was it the Myers that owned that prior, way, way prior to the Shermans, right? I think that's... Yes, and, he had 1905. And they don't know when they abandoned the ranch. It was just abandoned. And I understand the, the uh, where did I hear, uh, they should have known by all the locks on the doors <laughs> that there was something going on there. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's unusual. But, you know, like I say, I think that people assume that Skinwalker Ranch or that, that 480-acre location is the only place that that's happening, but I have sources that live in Vernal and, and the outer areas, and it is the whole basin is a place that has cattle mutilations, strange creatures, UFO sightings, paranormal activity, so it's, it's very unusual, and I think that people there are reticent to talk about it, but when you get them talking, there's some truly magnificent stories that they have to share. Yes, now there's a Native American uh, reservation there or thereabouts, right? And they have... Right, yep, yeah, the Ute And they have stories as well. Um, so I, I remember from the book that when the Shermans bought the place right off the bat, I think it was even the first day they had strange things happening, Right. You know, they, they did, they did, and it, it, you know, I mean, again, they're just good down to earth people that wanted to try cattle ranching. And so they were there and they began to experience kind of the poltergeist activity. Um, Chris O'Brien was actually on the phone with Mr. Sherman when his wife saw, you know, the, the spheres that were kind of uh, chasing the dogs. And that was the night when, or the day when the dogs were reduced to a grease puddle, you know, and, and he could hear Mr. Sherman on the phone just screaming in a panic. And those dogs were very dear oh. to him from what Chris said. And, and that was incredibly shocking. I mean, I, I can't imagine. I know about all of this, you know, and, and to me, I would I could be in that situation. I would still be shocked. But to to not be even in that realm... And to have something like that happen and repeatedly and to be terrorized, I can't imagine how that would be. And, you know, besides the UFO sightings, which we can talk about a little bit because they're kind of vague to me, but it seems to me that they did see one uh, that looked like a craft, but mostly it was lights other than that. But besides that, they had so many uh, really strange things happening, like a garden tool all of a sudden being up in the top of a tree when when they walked away and you know on and on and on so yeah like poltergeist right and right. Um, i wouldn't have lasted in that house for a day <laughs> i would have been gone <laughs> oh come on <laughs> well maybe i would look for a ufo but <laughs> where's your sense <laughs> <Yeah>. of adventure <laughs> It, I mean, it is it, it is disconcerting, and I I can't imagine with some of the the creatures or the you know the the large animals that are being shot that don't go down. I mean, there is or or the kind of the portals that would open up and and to see strange creatures emerging. I mean, there's so many things that would leave you absolutely. Stunned, but I think at some point, Mr. Sherman, you know, he was he was almost I think he he just was determined to figure out what it was. And after he sold the property to Robert Bigelow, and he was still there, kind of in an advisory capacity. I know he stayed on. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So um, we um, we're having a little bit of an internet issue. I'm hoping that uh, um, our do you have anything going on on your end, Erica? No? no. Okay. All right. It, it keeps cutting out on this no, side. But, all right. Well, we'll just continue on. If it gets really bad, um, I might have to have you shut your camera and see if that helps any. But um, so okay. um, Bigelow bought it and then tried to do a scientific review of this whole thing, which I think is quite amazing. I mean, that's a pretty bold step. And he tried to get... Uh, as many like PhD type people there that that would you know really take this thing seriously and 
what an undertaking. But I understand there was a lot of boring times. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, that's the thing with with unexplained phenomena. I mean, you you got to sit around and you never you can never predict it. And so, just when you get you know, you're just resting on your laurels and thinking, okay, I'm going to go make a ham sandwich. I mean, that's when something happens. So it is a lot of sitting around and waiting. It's like going on a sky yeah. watch and, Good point. and yeah. you know, I mean, you can't, yeah, you just, it's, it's not immediate gratification. Right, right. Let's put it that way. But, but when something happens, I think it takes you months to recover. Yes. yes. Um, now there, there is some, I neglected to tell you that we had some people send in a bunch of questions for us. Um, so someone wanted to know if, um, did this phenomena, whatever it was, appear to react and materialize, um, to certain individuals more than others that lived on the ranch? Oh boy. You know, I, that's a, a great question. And I, from my understanding, it, it happened, to all of them, um, I think that the, that Mr. and Mrs. Sherman probably there were more stories that were told, you know, instead of involving the rest of the family. For I would imagine, you know, because that's something you don't want to put your family out there and talk too much about their experiences. That's a great question. Yeah, yeah that's true. I wonder about now. I know there was, um, if I remember when I was reading the book, uh, if I remember correctly, there was one of the science people there that was really upset because he kept missing things, <laughs> you know, uh, so that, that, could, that would be me. <laughs> we'll never say never. Maybe we, we just need to go on a little camping trip out there. I don't know. But it, it you know, I think that I'm, I'm sure it's frustrating, especially for a, a diehard scientist, you know, because you're used to, to doing things and having that repeatability and, and having, um, that control over things. And so when you get into a situation where you don't have that and then you miss something, I mean, that would be incredibly frustrating. So what, what were going back to the native Americans, what were some of the things that they would talk about? Um, and like oral history, if there was oral history in that area, do you, did you ever look into any of that? You know, the, it, it's a really complex interesting history and i think you have uh the utes and the navajo uh, the history there and apparently when the utes and the navajo the, the utes kind of drove out the navajo and the navajo cursed the ute indians and then you've got the mormons coming in and trying to settle the area and trying to restrict the the ute indians i mean you've got all of this really uh, tumultuous activity in in the basin. And then you've got the Gilsonite miners that were coming in because the Uinta Basin is really rich with minerals and rare earth. And so you've got all of this. And it was a pretty kind of a rough and tumble place. And Brigham Young, you know, way back when, really, um, you know, the Mormons came out to this area and decided that they really weren't necessarily interested in it so they they moved on and they they relegated this um ute uh reservation for the ute indians but it's it's a lot of activity and the indians the ute indians will not go near skinwalker ranch because they believe it is cursed wow. and and skinwalkers are not necessarily I mean, it's, it's pretty heavy stuff and it's very real yeah yeah i mean there's Definitely something going on here. Um, the you mentioned earlier the portal. That whole uh, that whole situation is the most amazing thing to me that happened there, and that actually happened in front of Bigelow's people. And, right, and there definitely some you know you hear some different conflicting stories with regard to that. I mean, I've heard the story that there was the portal that that opened up and and creatures emerged from the portal and there was gunfire exchange. Oh, I never heard that part. Um, wow. Yeah. I mean, I've heard little bits and pieces about that and I have nothing to back that up other than other people telling me that, but it's, um, it's quite intriguing. So now, when you were involved in, um, move on in the state, the state director, were you getting reports, any reports from that particular area, the basin? 
you know, we did. And it was, it was interesting because, oh gosh, about three years ago, I got a report from someone who I've since been researching not only him, but his family. And he worked on the, the oil fields, uh, the oil, oil fields. And he had, he sent me a photo and he said that he would see these craft kind of hovering above the oil fields. And he said to me, he said, well, you know what, I've, I've seen this for a long time as have the other workers on the field, but we just, you know, it's something that, okay, there it is again. And then we don't really talk about it. And he said, but, you know, you really need to talk to my grandmother because a couple decades ago, she was out rock hounding with the family and she went missing and she came back. They were panicked, came back a couple hours later. And when they found her, she was disoriented and had radiation burns wow. on her. Really? Wow. And so yeah, it was really fascinating. And so, of course, I'm like, OK, <laughs> let's go. So I contacted his mother and said I wanted to come up there and they're in Vernal, Utah. And I, I went up there with my cameraman, um, Matt Hepworth, and we did a two day interview with the grandmother who's in her early 90s and the mother. And it was very um in the interview and I need to edit that and get that out there. But it was, you know, here's this good uh, religious woman who talks about her experiences as, as a small child and, and having some health issues, having these beings come into her bedroom, having different experiences with UFOs. And then they also, to add to that, they knew the caretaker of the the ranch, you know, back in the day. And they told me a story of having uh, this ranch hand bring them the flesh or the, the meat of the, a, mu- a mutilated cow uh, uh-huh. to eat. <laughs> and they tried it. <laughs> oh, no. Wow. <laughs> and they said it didn't taste very good. Yeah, it was it was really interesting, but it was touching to hear her you know, I mean, here she is, 90 years old, and to talk about how profound, frightening, um, and and beautiful this experience, these experiences were, and to also hear her talk about the fact that she couldn't really communicate. She wanted to talk to her parents, and she knew that they knew, but they just they didn't know how to deal with it. And her story. Her daughter's story and and uh, the grandson. I mean, this isn't this is not an isolated case. These are cases that happen and they happen in in the Uinta Basin frequently. And these, I believe that a lot of these people are truly looking for answers. And and it's pretty staggering. Right, right. I wonder if anyone has mutilated cow on the menu out there in any restaurants. No, I don't think so. I hear it doesn't taste very good. I can't even imagine the health effects that of that. But yeah. that was just when she when they shared that story. Wow. I'm, oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that one's going to make Not it. Don't edit choice. that one. That one out. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> um, so the, another question is: speaking of cattle mutilations, um, do you have a theory why there have been cattle mutilations at the ranch, but no attempt to physically harm the people that were living there? Oh boy, that's a million dollar question, and I think that's the question anywhere in the in the world where there are animal mutilations. I mean, we don't we don't know. There's some researchers that believe that there are uh, human mutilations. You know, that's that's a a road that I don't go down because my research is is a little bit different than than that. But I definitely think that the cattle mutilations is, are very interesting in the basin and that is something that has affected people it has affected their their livelihood and it's a very real concern and it's something that the Utah state vet has known about for decades yeah um, in the book um, it's not just you know the regular regular old if there is such a thing cattle mutilations but there was a there was one of the cows that it only could have been dropped somehow. Its head was straight down into a hole 
um, and then fallen over and, and mutilated, you know, on site right there. Really strange. And that one was probably the strangest mutilation that happened on the site. But I, I think that um, they actually, uh, th- these things were like almost happening under their noses when the, uh, when the original family was there. Right. Yeah. And I, th- I think that that's still the case. I mean, a cattle rancher can go out there and, you know, turn turn their back. And 10 minutes later, they've got one of their, their prized possessions has, has been mutilated. So it's very disconcerting for all of them. And again, you know, who do you who do you turn to? You know, you can call the authorities and they can come take the police report. And at the end of the day, what does that do? I know that a lot of cattle ranchers now aren't reporting that because it, the insurance gets involved and the insurance won't pay for for the loss of of, of the animal. Yeah. And they're they're always uh, coming back with the uh, you know predators like a wolf or something like that. Now there's there's actually right. no wolves supposed to be out that way. First of all, right? Mm, yeah. I mean, I don't think so. I remember reading something about that they're not indigenous to that area. Yeah, it's it's interesting. And it, it's 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 perplexing and you know, I have a a contact that is a third gener- generation cattle rancher out near Skinwalker Ranch and he remembers having his his pet pony mutilated oh. at a oh. young age. And you know, having I mean the again the Utah state vet out there looking at at what had happened and not a lot of answers. And I think that it would be really good if at some point the Utah State vet and and crew would actually be willing to work with other researchers to try to figure this out. You know, I know myself, I've reached out to the Utah State vet and have had not a lot of love in that regard. So, I mean, he's been cordial, but... yeah. Well, I imagine that there could be a lot of friction involved in, in something like that because when it's kind of like the same um, as far as any of this stuff really goes, when there's no easy explanation for it, um, then um, it, it causes a little bit of friction um, when someone is in more of the mainstream idea of the whole situation. Right. And, I mean, I I understand, too, you know, we've got – people that are in this field that kind of swoop in and will go in and run a story and then leave with regard to that and not give the people in the area a lot of help or support. And to me, I think that's critical. I I am not a, a journalist, you know, I'm a researcher and I feel like it's my my duty to be a support system for people that are going through this, not just come in and get my story and run away. So I think that, you know, there's some things that we need to do to, to give people comfort and to try to, to make a cohesive unit with all these different branches. Right. Right. Someone in the chat room wanted to know if there was any, um, anyone ever reported this to animal cruelty, but that would only be pointing fingers at um, people if um yeah, as the culprit in that case right um so yeah i don't think that they would get involved with that part and t- unless they um actually had a, a more of an explanation but um so um another question that i had seen earlier was someone wanted to know um basically if you knew what all the different anomalous uh phenomena was going on there you know Oh boy! I mean, there everything that you can think about is going on there. You've got the anomalous light phenomena. You have the the poltergeist activity. You've got uh, the strange creatures. You have the I mean, the skinwalkers, the shapeshifters. Um, you have oh, the, I mean, just really off the wall things. You've got reports of of scoop marks in the soil where where soil has been extracted and then neatly placed to the side. You have um, reports of underground machinery, of the sounds of underground machinery. So, or vortexes. I mean, it, it's you you name it. It's it's happening there, and it it really is. I think that 
Hunt for the Skinwalker was a very good representation of the kind of bizarre phenomenon that is taking place there repeatedly. Wow. Now, someone did ask a question about a vortex, and they mentioned, uh, let me just see if I can find that here. Um, the uh, Unita Basin is next to uh, Wasatch Mountains. Do you think the machinery sounds that people report hearing in the basin could be related to existence and existence of secret U.S. Navy? Why Navy? I don't know why Navy. Installation. Oh, that Dr. Michael Sala claims is located in a huge underground caverns in those mountains. Do you know anything about Michael Sala or anything? <laughs> you know, a yeah. little bit. Um, again, it's not my my forte, um, mm-hmm. but I, I do, you know, I have heard about the Navy. I've heard that tossed about with regard to Skinwalker Ranch and some of the experiments and things when Bigelow was there. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's, it. it's so hard for me to speculate on things like that because I, until I've got kind of the facts about things, I, I, I could give my opinion, but I don't know what yeah good that would do i think the underground machinery is very strange but i think it's not just uh taking place in this area you know you've got reports of that all over the world in specific hot spots oh, how about that now you mentioned earlier that there's a, a lot of minerals in in the area and a lot of times that seems to be the case with flap areas you know, there's something right. going on there, like a high copper content or high this or high right. that. Um, has anyone ever reported any electromagnetic type of phenomena that you're aware of? You know, there are some uh, anomalies uh, right over Skinwalker Ranch. And I think that that whole area, there also, a, there also is a fault line that runs through Skinwalker Ranch. And so you've got a lot of different things that are are taking place and then you've got the different mineral and rare earth content in that area you've got um granite and and quartz and and um you've also got and i'm I'm just trying to think and i'm totally you know having a mind cramp um oh it'll come to me later but i mean you've got unique uh mineral content in the area and i think to me when i've done my research here in not only in Utah, but when I'm looking at these different areas where you see recurrent phenomena, you've got definitely some key factors that are taking place. You've got some commonalities. So you've got specific, like the copper, you've got specific mineral content. You have a military installation that's located close by. You have um, a sacred site or, you know, say in the United States, you've got the, the Native American reservations. In Australia, you have the Aborigines, you've got different cultures that view certain sites as very sacred. And so I think it's it's intriguing. You also have, you know, bodies of water. So why are these, you know, why why is this happening in specific places? I, I think that we need to look at the commonalities. We need to kind of reframe the way we're researching, especially here in the United States, and kind of move forward instead of waiting for that one golden nugget. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, th- I want to talk a little bit about what you um, have discussed in the past with Erling Strand as well, because I think that's a very interesting um, area. But someone wanted to know, are there any nuts and bolts type of UFO sightings that you're aware of? And I know in the book it mentioned one. I just, you know, I read the book in 2013, I think it was, uh, or 14. I can't really remember it. You know, I mean, there were, and and I think, you know, we've got to define what nuts and and bolts is, really. I mean, I, I... this is the million dollar, another million dollar question, but it's like, was it the solid craft? I mean, there was a kind of a refrigerator type object that they saw hovering above ground level. You know, they that saw right, that. Or they so thought it was sure an RV at first, right? Yeah, right, I remember that. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm not sure if that's what they're referring to, but um, I think that, you know, don't get me started on the nuts and bolts because I could go into Chinese lanterns too, <laughs> and then you'd have trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so, what about the uh, temperature drops? Someone wanted to know. Are you know anything about that? Any temperature drops with sightings? 
You know, it's like the paranormal sightings. I mean, when you've got something that is taking place in close close proximity, a lot of people will report there's a drastic decrease in temperature. And so that's a a curious thing to me. I know I had a, a sighting that was very peculiar, a personal sighting. And when I had that, and that was probably about 20 feet away from me, I I'd noticed that the, the temperature dropped drastically in the area, and that was my personal experience there. But this is something that's pretty common with paranormal phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. Um, when were you, you were actually, did you actually get to go on the ranch itself or just outside the area? No, it was just outside the area. Um, and I was doing some some research and interviews. But, you know, I hope, I keep hoping that I'll get to go on the ranch, but we'll see. Yes. With the new security and everything, we're not quite sure, but yeah, armed guards we'll see there. what happens. Yeah. Um, yes. And it yeah. all came about because just people were going in there and they were breaking in. It was it used to have just a regular road gate, which um, if they're watching live on YouTube, it's behind me. And the green screen is the uh, the road gate there. Um and now it's all like um, Jersey uh, barriers and, you know, a uh, uh, guardhouse and all that um, to keep people out right. of there. And that's that's almost um, overkill. I mean, it must cost a fortune to to keep people out of there. Um, you know, I, I'm sure and I, you know, I mean, I understand why they would want to do that. I mean, there, there are several reasons. First of all, you've got liability. You know, you've got some someone coming onto private property and you've got strange things taking place um, and, and people that go on there with no regard to the private property. You know, they could injure themselves and then you've got the liability issue. But, I mean, you've also, I mean, it's just that people that go up there are typically not the most respectful. That's a shame. And I think that that's unfortunate. You know, people are trying to, I mean, I, I heard reports of people trying to take pieces of the fence or the gate and different things. And I mean, it's just, you know, if you're, that's just, it's, that's not okay to do. Plus, um, wasn't so, there a movie called Skinwalker Ranch kind of came out? Um, so if that happened, then it's part of pop culture. And of course, people are going to start stealing things. Do you know the name of the the family or a corporation or whatever it is that bought it now? So it is, it is owned by Admantium Holdings ah, mm-hmm. and no one really knows who, who is behind that. Um, it, you know, there's speculation that Robert Bigelow is still involved in some regard. I don't know. Um, I, I, I think that's I, that's something that all of us who research the area have been trying to figure out. You know, who is this mystery company person, and what are they doing? It does sound like, from what George Knapp said, that whoever they are, they they appear to be really putting some good money into researching, and hopefully those results the the data will be shared with the public which is something that didn't happen when nids was involved when bigelow was involved right right yeah someone just put on the message board it's too bad that they announced the location in the first place it really is you know i mean that's um i'm sure someone would have figured it out eventually um but still it it's not an anonymous place you can find it without too much trouble (laughs) right yeah yes you can yeah but, um, you know, and it's kind of like the Marley Woods. I mean, you've yeah. got these places that we try to keep. Well, we didn't, weren't even trying to keep Skinwalker Ranch secret. But, you know, you've got the location and, hey, everybody go here. And, and you know, yeah, it's one of those right. things. Do you happen to, That's why you need security yeah, guards. Right. Do you happen to know if the military ever had any interest in this? Has, did anyone ever talk about that? You know, there 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 has been some speculation. I mean, I've heard that the CIA, I've heard all sorts of different people involved. Um, and and so I don't really know for sure. Um, but, you know, you can look on, I know Ryan Skinner's done some pretty good research and he has skinwalkerranch.org. You can look on there and he'll kind of lie out, he'll um, put the timeline out there and you can look at, at that and some of his beliefs on who was involved with the military. But I have heard, and I, I 
still get reports that there are there are people there in black suburbans. There are very unusual. There's unusual activity. Uh, uh, the black helicopter activity. How about men in black? Someone wanted to things. know. Has has that? You know, my it, it that it's that Ryan Burns, who lives um, and now he's in kind of Vegas half the time, but he has a, a a ranch that again is close to Skinwalker Ranch, and he had. And he's got, I think it's video or photographic evidence of people coming onto his property, two men dressed in, in suits with strange pieces of equipment doing something out there. So they're definitely, I mean, if you call that a man in black, I, that, that would be a good yeah. one for me. Yeah. But yeah. Now, do you know if anyone has ever tried to track down any Myers family members? I know that they were... They're only in the so the late 1930s, but you know you wonder if any family uh, lore ever went on about what happened. It would be really interesting to know. In other words, if things were going on back in you know prior to um, the you know in the 1930s or so. From my understanding, they there have been people that have reached out to the family, and there was nothing that they wanted to, to share, or you know they didn't think that there was activity taking place there. But yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, the whole there's so much research to be done. So we just hope that you know maybe the new owners will will open that up for researchers. Right, right. Um, now let's talk about other other places um you know getting back to uh erling strand you spoke with him about what's going on there now he actually thinks it's not a natural phenomena which a lot of people are speculating that it's some type of natural uh like plasma creation or something like that um so what do you know about that hasbalon you know, Heshtal in Norway is 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 its sleepy little you know town in Norway. And back in the oh my gosh, was it the late eighties? They had you know the the town was up in arms because they were seeing these objects over. I mean, a close proximity, and they reached out. Did they talked to the the press, and then the word got out and, and the town was kind of besieged by different members of the press who were always so kind, you know, to people that have sightings, as we know. But Erling Strand and uh, Leif Havoc and and some other people from Otsvold University found out about that and they went there and did a two week study from my recollection and found that there was there were some truly anomalous things taking place there. And so they acquired funding and then ended up staying there for 30 years. They have the world's only place, that, an actual dedicated building, a UFO observatory where they collect data and they share that with different universities. They have a science camp where they will take the students from the university out there and teach them how to scientifically investigate anomalous phenomena. And there's a, a really great uh, video available on YouTube about Heshtalan and some of the, the different sightings. And you can see the there's a, a clip where the kids in science camp are out there and they're experiencing, they're seeing things and they're they're collecting the, the data and video. It's incredible. And you can just hear the, the joy in their voices. Yeah. I mean, they're screaming. It's incredible. But, you know, they have done such a good job and they've been very cognizant of the fact that they've had to kind of tone down the way they approach this subject. So it's been, you know, never, there's never been a mention of UFO. Mm. It has been, let's collect the data, you know, let's see what we get. And then we will say, you know, this is anomalous light phenomena. And then just recently, I mean, they've identified that there are four different types of light phenomena that behave intelligently. Wow. And that that's saying something. So you've got really credible research here and you've got a, a group of people like Erling Strand who is very willing to share this information and teach people how to get out there and collect data for themselves and that's important. Yes. All right, that's it for the free part of the show and if you'd like to listen to the whole shows plus 
the Everything Else show as a podcast. All you have to do is support us for $2 or more a month. You can get that information on podcastufo.com. As I mentioned in the beginning of the show, next week's guest is Justin Barber. He is the Phoenix Forgotten uh, movie uh, film director, and we'll be taking calls at the end of that show as well. All right, so thanks so much, and keep your eyes to the sky.